Good afternoon and welcome to this meeting organized by the Marcello De Cecco Association. I introduce myself, I'm Marco Panara, I'm a member of the board of the association. The association is chaired by Mario Mendola, from whom I greet you. Um, uh, I apologize with the American friends, I just say a few words in Italian, then we will go on in English. Uh, queste poche parole in italiano per raccontare brevemente come siamo arrivati a questo incontro di oggi. Eh, L'idea di fare una riflessione sull'evoluzione sull del pensiero economico nell'ultimo mezzo secolo e sul suo impatto sulle pollici è di Pierluigi Giocca, un economista raffinato e eh, altrettanto raffinato storico dell'economia e socio dell'associazione. Ci abbiamo pensato un po' e abbiamo di deciso di cominciare questa riflessione, questo è un percorso che magari porteremo avanti con l'incontro di oggi. Questo incontro avrebbe dovuto essere in presenza e svolgersi a Torino nel bellissimo auditorium uh, che è nel grattacielo progettato da Renzo Piano, che è la sede di Banca Intesa San Paolo, e Banca Intesa San Paolo ci avrebbe accompagnato nella realizzazione di questo progetto. Poi la recrudescenza della pandemia ci ha, ci ha consigliato prudenza ed eccoci qui. So now we, we, we can go on in English. Uh, as you know, the title of our seminar is Jobs, Finance, Globalization, 50 Years of Economic Thinking to the Test of History. Uh, we are pleased to have very illustrious speakers with us today. Um, Samuel Bowles, economist, professor at the Santa Fe Institute of New Mexico, authors, among others, of a book released in 2016, Title is yes, The Moral Economy Why Good Incentives Are No Substitute for Good Citizen, which was followed by an important international debate. Bowles will talk about work with Ugo Pagano, professor at the University, the University of Siena. Then we have Katarina Pister, jurist, professor at Columbia Law School, author of the COP. Code of Capital, a recent book, a recent book that has had a global impact. Katarina actually has one of the jurists most influential, uh, whose thinking is the most influential now in the international arena. Katarina give, will give her a speech about finance and we'll, we'll talk with Bruno Ingrao, former professor at La Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, the third block, uh, we'll see Danny Roderick, economist, professor at Harvard University, author among others of a number of books about globalization, the globalization paradox, strike talk on trade, has globalization gone too far? Uh, it will focus, obviously, on globalization, and we'll talk with Maurizio Franzini of La Sapienza University on Rome. Uh, it is possible to comment and uh, make questions, or ask questions on the association's Facebook page. At the end of the speeches, I will try to summarize and submit them to our speakers. Uh, we would like to open the works with a short, uh, brief introduction to the thought of Marcello De Cecco, who inspired the activity of the association. Um, Alfredo Giglio Bianco, a member of the board of, of the association, executive of the Bank of Italy, and uh, a historian, uh, uh, the one who oversaw the new edition of Money Empire, the book that revealed Marcello De Cecco talents, he will talk about it. Uh, Alfredo. Well, <laughs> I'm here because uh, basically I knew Marcello well, and uh, also my personal contribution was that of uh, creating this new edition of uh, his work. And my hope, my personal hope is that uh, sometimes we would have uh, a, new a new English edition um, of, of, of the work, which I believe uh, is, uh, would be very useful in understanding better his thought and in understanding better international monetary relations. Well, we all know Marcello as a very strong, provo provocative debater. He was an intellectual fully engaged in, in the debate of his time about Italy, about Europe, uh, about the world. Uh, now, why? was the, his uh, voice so interesting, so original, because his reasoning was not only sharp, but was uh, very strongly based in uh, theory. 
So basically, uh, he started from theory. And then on top of that, uh, he put his uh, way of looking at the world, which was very original, fresh, and certainly not conditioned by received wisdom. So in his uh, method of analysis, there was uh, a very characteristic element, which, do, which not always we find in the equations of economists. And this element was power. I'm talking about economic power, political power, even military power. Uh, as an example, take the Anglo-Indian uh, relations that he analyzed in his book, Money and Empire. And uh, that is a, uh, a relationship which was strongly characterized by imperial power used by England in order to uh, dominate India. Um, well, while mainstream used to focus on adjustment mechanisms of uh, economics that lead to some kind of natural and stable equilibrium, Marcello De Cecco was particularly fond of uh, uh, analyzing power relations that could lead to unstable equilibria subject to uh, periodic crisis. And he had also a, a knack to uh, dismantle certain ideas, received wisdom that was normally accepted uh, um, uh, among economists. Uh, and he was uh, uh, looked after by people who was unsatis unsatisfied about uh, these received wisdom. Um, Basically, he was able to frame theory within history. I'll make an example. Not only he was a, a very fine connoisseur of Keynes, he knew uh, uh, Keynes thought uh, very well, but he knew the, the world in which Keynes was working. Uh, he knew institutions, he knew the firms, he knew the culture, he knew what, the, what Keynes contemporary uh, loved and uh, what they were seeking. So uh, while you read his pages, let's take uh, a, 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 a fantastic uh, uh, article. It's called The Last of the Romans. That this, this article appeared in a book edited by Robert Skidelsky. The, the title is The End of the Keynesian Era. So if you read his contribution, Marcello's contribution, you, you, can all, you can sometimes see the, uh, the theoric word of Keynes, uh, which is forming under your eyes. Um, let's, let's take a, a very short, uh, a very short uh, uh, excerpt from, from this article. He says about Keynes, he never considered the problem of supply as interesting on the very good assumption that Britain had even too much of it. Or even or this other one. If one looks at them carefully, Keynes' main analytical works, the treatise and the general theory, explain through what forces, mechanisms, and circuits the richest economy in the world was reduced to working at half steam. So, uh, as you can gather from these words, uh, uh, it's clear that uh, in uh, De Cecco's view the engine of theory is not theory itself, it's history. It's history that moves theory. And if you want a confirmation of this, let's read a, a piece of an article that he uh, wrote uh, in a book that he edited with Jochen Lawrence. And the title of the book is Markets and Authorities, Global Finance and Human Choice. Uh, he says in this article, about theory, about the development of theory. Personally, I tend to see theoretical developments as being the servants of politicians who certainly want to be elected and re-elected and have thus to read the minds of individual electors and powerful interest groups. Thus, a theory suddenly comes into fashion after having been neglected for years, sometimes whole decades, when it is useful to justify a turn in domestic policy 
dictated by much more mundane reasons. Monetarism and rational expectations are good examples. The first was good to justify the drive to deregulate US banking, as it maintained that it is not necessary to include banks in macroeconomic control, as controlling the monetary aggregates more than suffice to keep inflation at bay. The second, rational expectations, become very handy when Reagan was piling up public debt, as it proved that people know the model as well as the authorities and will not be fooled into believing that that is a permanent substitute of taxation. Is that too radical? Perhaps. But the radical attitude is here at its best. Sometimes to go to the root of problems, you need a very strong shock to receive the wisdom. And certainly, De Cecco was the right person to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfredo. Uh, I think that the, 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 the piece of thinking of Marcello that you choose, that you choose are very uh, 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 acute, are, are very uh, right for, for, for the seminar that we are now starting. And we will start with the first of the three pillars that we put on our title, Jobs, Finance, Globalization. We start with the jobs, and we will now hear Samuel Bowles uh, that will give his speech, and then he will discuss uh, of, about these issues, this issue with Ugo Bagano. Sam, at you. Thanks very much, Marco. Uh, for the introduction and uh, for organizing this uh, meeting. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to remember Marcello De Cecco, who I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, uh, a very long time ago uh, in Siena. Uh, and it was a great uh, 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 pleasure and privilege to know him at the time. Uh, it's, I'm also very happy to continue a conversation with Ugo Pagano which began at the same time, about 43 years ago. Uh, and uh, Ugo uh, was way ahead of the game in the study of labor economics, uh, starting with his dissertation. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he will have many interesting things to say in response to uh, my uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> to give you some idea of how much has changed in the economics of work and labor, I want to read a passage from a conservative chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK. Uh, and just listen carefully. And remember, this is a conservative chancellor of the Exchequer. Monopsony in the labor market is much more common than was previously considered the case. OK, he's just reporting there a large body of econometric results. But listen to the next sentence. As such, a minimum wage is not a distortion to the market, but a correction to the market. What? The minimum wage is a correction to a market failure rather than a market failure itself. Minimum wages promote productivity and a more efficient allocation of labor. Uh, who knows? Perhaps today is the day in which we begin to abolish low pay, not only in Britain, but in the world. Now, I'm, I'm reminding you, this is a conservative chancellor of the exchequer. Can you imagine that having been written 10, 15, 20 years ago? Uh, now, um, I want to continue on that theme because uh, uh, over the past four decades, uh, our, our understanding of how the labor market works and how firms work, it's been transformed by um, new data and new theory. And this really is the case, as Alfredo said, and as Marcello would have appreciated, this is the case of history being the engine of theory. Uh, a lot of the new theoretical ideas about labor markets came out of the 70s with the end of the so-called golden age of capitalism uh, and the end of the long expansion. Um, part of the new work in labor economics was stimulated by the productivity slowdown, which took place under conditions of very high employment and the so-called high employment profit squeeze. Uh, now, uh, and that's where, I mean, I know, I, I know people came together trying to figure out what's going on. And a lot of the models of uh, labor discipline and so on stem from that period. But 
let me say a little bit about what the change means. Uh, and I, I'm going to take this in an unusual direction. I'll focus on just a couple of things. <clears throat> the first is picking up again on Marcello's work. Uh, the word power is now accepted in polite conversations among economists. It used to be laughed at as undefinable or something which didn't have a, a place in our discipline. So uh, that's the new kid in town is power. And um, it's uh, on everyone's agenda, whether it's power in the labor market as the monopsony case I just mentioned, or power of the employer over the employee. But I wanna add a second word, maybe not as recognized yet, but that's dignity. Dignity as a part of the objectives that might be taken into account as we consider questions of shared affluence and the possible inadequacy of shared affluence as a normative framework for going forward. So let me, uh, let me talk first about the, uh, the past. Um, we, uh, the, the, the model uh, called neoclassical depicted a perfectly competitive labor market. It, populated by price-taking firms uh, in which supply equals demand uh, in the long-run equilibrium. And of course, that applied also to the labor market. Uh, what that meant, of course, is that workers who lost their job really didn't lose anything because if the market clears, they were able to get the same transaction uh, immediately across the street. Now, this is, um, uh, it's, it's interesting um, in describing this model, Abel Lerner in the 70s, uh, a great um, uh, microeconomist, he wrote in the um, AER, an economic transaction is a solved political problem. Economics has gained the title queen of the social sciences by choosing solved political problems as its domain. That is a very deep and profound statement. He understood that the success of the neoclassical paradigm was to focus on areas where contracts are complete. Abel Lerner continues after this in, uh, to say, yes, a solved political problem is something which is covered by a complete contract. Why is that a solved political problem? It's because if I'm exchanging something with you and a complete contract, there is no power relationship between us. It's already in the contract. Uh, and uh, if you don't fulfill the terms of your contract, I can call the courts in and solve the problem. That was the standard view. Now notice how intimately that view, the neoclassical view is connected to the, the uh, abstracting from the problem of power. Now in the new models, which are now standard, they're taught at all levels of the curriculum, uh, but uh, starting with grad school and finally cascading down uh, by a, a slow trickle down to the um, undergraduate, the way we see the labor market and work uh, this is a world of uh, not price taking buyers and sellers, but rather principals and agents. Uh, principals, for example, owners in the labor market or lenders in finance markets and their agents, employees, or borrowers. Uh, the firms are now represented as wage setting, not, uh, wage setting and price setting, not price taking. Um, and uh, of course, in these models, Unemployment is a property of long run equilibrium. Uh, now, what's happened, of course, is that uh, the world that was described by Abba Lerner, uh, the, the, the domain over which the queen, that is us, economics, uh, ruled, uh, what he thought at the time it's probably pretty small. Uh, and it's true. The domain over which complete contracts reigns in the economy uh, was small then, because of course it didn't include credit markets and labor markets, uh, major markets in our economies. But now uh, these markets in which complete contracts are impossible have expanded into other areas, uh, particularly knowledge, care, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, so, uh, the, um, uh, but let's think a little bit about how, what it meant to get power off the table. Um, Economists in the past uh, actually had a concept of power, which they used. In the 1930s, Ronald Coase introduced a theory of the firm, which is almost indistinguishable from Marx's theory of the firm in the sense that he recognizes, Coase recognizes, that essentially what a firm is, is 
the suppression of a price system in favor of a system of authority. Uh, l listen to this. This is Ronald Coase in 1937. If a workman moves from department Y to department X, he doesn't go because of a change in prices, but because he's ordered to do so. The distinguishing mark of the firm is the suppression of the price mechanism. And then he continues. The character of the contract is that the worker for a certain remuneration agrees to obey the directions of the entrepreneur. So the labor contract is a contract about obedience. Uh, and that was correctly understood. Uh, now, well, what happened to that insight? Uh, it's an extraordinary, brilliant paper. Um, well, what happened was, uh, and uh, I, I think partly for mathematical reasons in the 50s and 60s, we adopted simpler models. Uh, I, um, I have very mixed feelings when I'll say I, I was part of the mathematization of the, uh, the uh, basic ideas in economics. I think I may have been the first person to introduce mathematical problem solving in a PhD uh, micro course. Uh, and the effect of this was to narrow the focus quite a bit. Um, so the problem with complete contracts is this. If the contract is complete, there's nothing for power to be about. That's uh, just off the table. Uh, it's already been settled in the contract. Now, what's interesting is getting power uh, set aside required not just a complete contract, but it re required a consequence of complete contracts, and that's that markets clear. The fact that markets clear means that the only power that an employer might have, he or she doesn't have, because if markets clear, as I've already said, there is no cost of being fired. You cross the street and get another job. So complete contracts did this uh, really thorough job of setting aside uh, the uh, issue of power by first essentially having nothing for power to be about. And then in case you're wondering, the employer can't have power because the employee has a next best alternative just as good as his current job. Now, if the contract is incomplete, we got a different world, radically different world. Uh, now, again, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to give you four points, which I don't think are controversial among microeconomists or those studying the labor process. The first is that the principal, either employer or lender, but let's talk about the employer, the principal X is power over the agent, over the worker. And that's because the principal can terminate the employment of the uh, worker at a cost to the worker who will have a hard time finding another job. The second is this power may be abused at no or virtually no cost by the principal. And what this means is that, for example, sexual harassment, racial insults, many aggressions in the workplace can be imposed on workers at virtually no cost to the employer. This is a somewhat mathematical result. It's a result of what's called the envelope theorem in, uh, in mathematics. Uh, but I don't think it's at all controversial. Perhaps my stress on racial insults or sexual harassment would be unusual, but the, the math of it is not in question. The third thing is that social norms like truth-telling, the work ethic, and so on, become part of how you sustain a mutually beneficial exchange. This was a point which Kenneth Arrow stressed uh, as early as uh, 1971, where contracts are incomplete. We trust social norms to do some of the job of completing the contract. That idea, by the way, goes back to Durkheim, who said in his famous book, The Division of Labor, not everything in the contract is contractual. He was some, simply talking, as Marx did, about the incomplete nature of the labor contract. Um, now, um, uh, the fourth is that the Nash equilibria uh, of these allocations between this employer and employee are Pareto inefficient. That is, they're inefficient in the standard economic sense. And just let me remind you, this has nothing to do with lack of competition. This is in a perfectly competitive model of this process with perfectly free entry and exit by firms. So we have these three things. The principal exercises power. That power may be abused at limited cost. Social norms are essential to sustaining uh, mutually beneficial exchanges and the resulting equilibria will be inefficient. Uh, now, this gives us a rich set of policies and interventions and criticisms of the world that we know. These criticisms were not available 
in the world described by Abba Lerner, uh, in, uh, in which uh, essentially there were no political problems and contracts were complete. For example, if the principal is exercising power, we can think about, well, in what sense do we want that power to be accountable to those affected? In the same way we would, for example, if a local government exercises some power over the citizens. Uh, the accountability of this power could be made uh, uh, possible, possible through worker ownership, through bargaining, through trade unions, through co-determination, and so on. Um, the power is abused or capable of being abused. How can we address that? Well, we could think about stronger individual rights in the workplace, uh, uh, which could enhance the dignity and equal status of workers. Uh, social norms being critical to the exchange process. This alerts us to something really crucial. In designing economic institutions, we want to make sure that we create a society which cultivates those values, the social norms, which are the basis, one of the bases for a successful economy. And finally, the fact that the allocations are inefficient means that interventions in these areas could have the advantage of creating coalitions of people, all of whom or most of whom would benef benefit from the interventions I was talking about. That is, many interventions of the type I just mentioned would actually increase the efficiency of the labor process. Let me close with uh, some suggestions about um, what this may mean. <clears throat> um, the neoclassical model created a curious phenomenon, which is representing the economy as what I call a morality-free zone. It's a little bit like a foreign embassy. If you get in there, the laws of the country don't really apply. Now, here's David Gautier, a very distinguished uh, philosopher. He wrote this. The presumption of free activity ensures that no one is subject to any form of compulsion or to any type of limitation not already affecting her actions as a solitary individual. And listen to this. Morality has no application to market interactions under the conditions of perfect competition. Wow. I mean, I asked him, uh, he, he must have meant under perf perfect competition, he, might, he must have meant and complete contracts. And yes, he affirmed that was, in fact, that was in Siena at one of our meetings that he affirmed that was indeed what he had meant. Uh, now, it's not perhaps surprising that you would hear from a conservative philosopher that the economy is a morality-free zone. It's a little more surprising to hear from Kenneth Arrow, who publicly identified himself as a socialist. Here's Arrow. Any complaints about the market system's operation can be reduced to complaints about the distribution of income. And the price system itself determines the distribution of income only in the sense of preserving the status quo. So please, no criticisms of the market except from the standpoint of the distribution of wealth. And so we are to conclude from Gautier and Arrow, a person I respect more than any other economist, I think, Aside from conditions about distributive justice, prices could do the work of morals. That's the idea here. Now, of course, uh, 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 there are um, uh, what this suggests is that if power is exercised in the ways that I just said, we have to think then what are the consequences of living under those powers? And I would like to then close by referring to some great works, uh, the, for example, Elizabeth Anderson, the philosopher about private government, uh, Pettit on uh, his, his book called Just Freedom. I want to think about expanding the, uh, the normative framework. Uh, when I think of what is it that should be shared equally and so on, it's not just affluence, it's shared equal dignity. Now, dignity is like power, kind of an uncomfortable idea for economists. But remember, uh, it's, not, it's not a new idea. Uh, just like Coase introduced power in, in economics a long time ago, dignity is much earlier. Um, you all know uh, uh, from Adam Smith, uh, of course, uh, that it, when he said, <clears throat> probably the most famous quote there, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer and the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Uh, and I have, I'm reading this from my undergraduate uh, Wealth of Nations, and that is uh, suitably un underlined. Uh, now, um, I didn't underline the next sentence. Um, 
The next sentence is, nobody but a beggar chooses to depend on the goodwill of others. That's what Smith said. That statement, which is quoted, is said to be about the invisible hand. It's not. It's about the markets may allow a certain kind of dignity which, in which people exchange as equals. Uh, that was Smith's point. So uh, those are uh, some ideas in the normative framework. Um, I can't close without mentioning that um, uh, the fact that we recognize employers as monopsonists has of course changed how we see questions of income distribution. Um, I'll mention one other thing. Empirical work uh, over, over the last 20 years or so has really suggested a new way of looking at long-term equilibrium, something that Marcello De Cecco would very much appreciate. Uh, studies of the China shock in America suggest that the massive unemployment that this has inflicted on people is not something that gets adjusted away by in a matter of months or even years. It's a matter that takes decades. People simply removing themselves from the labor force uh, and just being poor, uh, and also I think being uh, having threats to their dignity. This, the adjustment process is very slow. Um, or consider another, the, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, uh, I was said to be the only economist in America who was opposed to it. I'm sure it's not true, but that's what the New York Times once said. Uh, yes, I was opposed to it. Um, and I think it was quite predictable that the short run effects would be uh, quite uh, adverse to Mexican workers. Uh, this is entirely contradicts what we know about international trade theory. But the problem with NAFTA is that it was going to flood Mexico with cheap corn and drive out of business Mexican farmers. And that was the fallback position of the Mexican workers. Now, of course, in the very long run, it doesn't make sense for grain to be grown in Mexico if it can be grown much cheaper in America. The very long run is a very long time. Uh, that's now, uh, uh, we're now talking 30 years and there's been wage stagnation in Mexico for a long time. I don't have a good argument for that that is the result of NAFTA, but certainly, the look for wage increases that should have been the long run impact of NAFTA haven't yet occurred. Um, I look forward to your comments, Ugo. Ugo. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, that was a great uh, presentation, Sam. Thank you for that. And um, thank you for uh, mentioning about uh, our uh, relationship uh, that has lasted such a, a long time. Now we are getting old. Um, I must say that uh, you were not mentioning one thing, that actually this big change that occurred in the 80s, around uh, um, 1985, really was due to you and Joe Stiglitz, basically, in two articles that were published on the, the American Economic uh, Review. So what you were talking about, that uh, complete contracts imply that there is uh, no power, there is uh, no unemployment, uh, and so on. Well, that was uh, coached in the case of uh, Joe Stiglitz as a, a particular case of asymmetric information. He was also applying it to financial markets and so on. And you were stressing much more uh, the issue of power, but these were really the two important contribution. And in this way, we learn quite a lot about competitive markets, that also in competitive markets, there is the exercise of power that uh, basically when uh, people cannot write a complete contract, and they will shirk at work, that uh, may mean that uh, um, the only solution for the employer is to raise the wage. But if everyone is raising the wage, then you get some unemployment equilibrium and some exercise of power. And that is a very, very important result, you know. And uh, as you have said, many, many things follow from that. So if, I mean, if we have to say which one was a very important result, in the last 50 years uh, in the history of economic thought and uh, that of course uh, is uh, a good uh, test uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, 
history as well, then uh, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, that is uh, really a good example. Now, having uh, uh, said that, uh, I must say that then uh, the 90s have given us a completely different uh, framework. Why? Because uh, what happened really in the 90s uh, was uh, a different, uh, the advent of a different type of power. Um, it was not really the power uh, of the employer with respect to the employees. Employees were often kicked out their firms. And uh, this was really also due to a strong monopolization of the economy. The enforcement of intellectual property rights implied that uh, you could uh, decentralize production somewhere uh, else in uh, situations where uh, uh, workers had a very weak bargaining power. And this created a lot of inequality among workers of different firms. And uh, basically, uh, the monopolization uh, of uh, knowledge implied that uh, there was a first stage that was monopolized, the design of the product. It was mainly monopolized with patents. And uh, then the last stage that was mainly monopolized uh, with trademarks. And in between, you got production in competitive uh, poor situations where uh, they had uh, to deal with uh, the core firm as a monopolist of intellectual property rights uh, as patents and as a monopsonist of the good because uh, they had the trademark. So that was really the structure of power. Then then uh, was uh, added on top of uh, the standard relationship between employer and uh, employee. Now, uh, we have been uh, discussing many times about all this. Uh, and uh, you have held uh, usually a more optimistic uh, view about uh, the knowledge economy. Well, the idea is that uh, uh, knowledge can be shared and uh, it's a fugitive resource. And uh, so somehow, you know, sooner or later, in the knowledge economy, we should uh, see, if you like, less power and less monopolization. But then uh, international institutions uh, have changed. And uh, this is something that uh, Roderick, who will speak later, has been uh, talking about quite a lot. And the new institution of the global economy have uh, really implied uh, that uh, knowledge uh, has become a very important source of power. In terms of knowing about the consumers uh, and uh, the market, and uh, also uh, so the trademark and all the type of strategy, and in terms uh, of uh, having the know-how and uh, having uh, the patents. So we got uh, this uh, different framework. This different framework also was related to a big uh, explosion of financialization. Why? Because although the economy was not working uh, for much of this time, it was even stagnating, you were creating a lot of new assets, so-called intangibles, basically intellectual uh, property rights, monopoly rights, that could be sold on the market and on which you could have financial claims. So the growth of intangibles and uh, the growth of finance went uh, really together. And of course, all this uh, went together with uh, uh, globalization because uh, basically uh, intellectual property rights that were seen as an obstacle to trade, some sort of tariff became a condition of trade and all the states had to respect these uh, intellectual property rights. So, I mean, this is uh, uh, my comment. I mean, uh, to uh, repeat it in terms of uh, an expression that we have used very often uh, during our conversation, you have been uh, often comparing uh, uh, ideas to giraffes, okay, that are free 
And, uh, you know, and I say, well, it is maybe, you know, born as giraffes, but then they have been uh, mutated into ordinary cows. And this is uh, what capitalism is about. So this is uh, my comment that you know very well. Okay, thanks. That's all. Sam, may I add to us just one thing? Uh, I see in the future a trend that can affect uh, the labor market and the economic thinking about the labor market. And this trend is the demographic trend in the industrialized country. Can you just add a short comment on this, Sam? Uh, on, on, on the demographic, I'm sorry to say that um, I, I really haven't thought about that very much. And um, I will try to practice uh, not talking about things that I don't haven't thought about. Uh, uh, sorry, maybe others do. Hugo will probably have something interesting to say about that. But I, I would like to come back to what uh, Hugo said. I think I'm guilty of having been twice, twice wrong. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, we uh, were very influenced by a book called Monopoly Capital, or Monopoly Capitalism, uh, a book by Baran and Sweezy. It was an update of Marx's work. And uh, I was a very strong critic of that book, and I told um, Paul Sweezy that on many occasions. And uh, the reason why is that I thought that globalization uh, would advance in such a way that even if there were only three automobile producers in America, the market would soon be 12 or 15 major producers once you included uh, uh, UK and particularly Germany and Japan and so on. So I saw globalization as the reason why Baran and Sweezy's monopoly capital wasn't really um, a good representation. And I remember thinking, uh, of course, the problem of concentration of economic power is important, uh, but I thought it was probably in those days much more important for political reasons than for economic reasons. And I was actually quite persuaded by the Chicago School, which uh, estimated the so-called welfare loss triangles associated with market power and found them to be rather small. Now, I may have been right at the time, uh, but of course, uh, the, my confidence that globalization would deal with the problem uh, simply was wrong, quite for the reasons that, um, uh, that Ugo has just mentioned. Uh, I, I didn't think that globalization and market power could be reconciled. Uh, and that's a mistake, as we now know, because of what Ugo said. And the other thing is um, about whether, uh, whether knowledge is more like a giraffe more valuable in the wild, and in any case, impossible to domesticate, to make it be private property. Um, there are still some very grave difficulties in turning ideas into private property. I don't mean there are grave consequences if they succeed. I mean, it's actually very difficult to do. But it has proceeded far enough so that I have to agree more with Ugo than with my previous position. Intellectual property has become more of a cow and less of a giraffe. And of course, what the, the fascinating thing about Uko's contribution just now is what he, he shows in addition to making the point about ideas being domesticatable and ownable, uh, there is also a way that globalization as, at, at a very high level can be, can be reconciled with uh, monopoly and limited competition. Uh, so thanks, Ugo, for showing me to be wrong on two things. Thank, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Hugo. It's been very interesting here, your comments. And we are very, very happy to have had you both with us today. I hope that you can continue to follow our seminar because now we have another important and surely interesting discussion and about finance. <coughs> and uh, Finance is, is one of the three pillars of our seminar, uh, labor, finance, globalization. And now Katarina Pistor will give her speech about finance and then comment on that with Bruna Ingrao. Katarina. Yes, hello. I hope I can be heard. Thank you so much for having me today. And I'm glad that we can meet at least online. 
so let me just start maybe with a response to what has been said before about the role of the history um, forging theory or helping to develop theory. I think I want to add to this that theory also has performative effects as sociologists would say. It also shapes the real world. Um, uh, one book that makes this very clear is Mackenzie's book about option pricing models. Uh, which he entitles, it's an engine, not a camera. I think in the world of law, the neoclassical economic theories that Sam was talking about have deeply influenced how we have interpreted legal institutions in the academy, but also in courts, especially in the United States, and how we have maybe entrenched an immoral view of the world into the law and thereby have accelerated or further deepened, I think, the interest of some over others. In a way, that is the topic in my Code of Capital, how a very narrow view of what property rights are um, and how they should be enforced against others and a set of other institutions have helped produce private wealth at the expense of others and enforced by a state and enforced by state courts in the name of increasingly economic um, models that have um, reinforced these ideas. So there's an interesting feedback loop and I think this is nowhere better visible than really in finance because it moves so fast and it develop so fast that you can see almost um, in real life how economic modeling affects real world practices and, um, and how also ideas about the law and how it's being used affects real world practices. Um, and, and of course, vice versa is, is true as well, but I just want to make this general point. Um, I wanted to just start by saying more about a little bit about the past, the ideas about finance, but then come to the present because I think there have been very important uh, developments recently. So in talking about the past, I've been relying also in, my, in, in, in talking to my students in law schools about this on a nice little paper that Perry Merling, a former colleague at Columbia wrote, uh, which he entitled um, uh, Minsk in Modern Finance, uh, the case of long-term capital management. Also a very nice example to look at a real world case, the collapse, the near collapse of long-term capital management in 1998, which could have been a precursor for us to understand the fragility of the financial system. And he uses the analysis, but also the perception of this case to show what modern finance has to say and what Minsky or post-Minskians have to say about this. So modern finance, as he characterizes, and I think it's a shorthand, but I think it's a useful one, is, is really about uh, capital markets, whereas Minsky is about money markets. It is about um, equilibrium models, about stocks, about trying to find um, ad adequate pricing models and uh, using portfolio theory in capital markets to understand the world. Whereas Minsky starts off by, first of all, saying capitalism is essentially a financial system. And if ca capitalism is imbued with power, I think we can also come to the question of how deeply infused finance is with power relations. But for Minsky, the, 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 the critical um, fin financial asset to watch was debt or credit, not stocks. Not, not shares for sure, maybe bonds, but debt and how debt flows through the economy and creates inherent instabilities in the economy is really what Minsky um, uh, was, was focusing on. And once you do that, once you start thinking about the economy or the financial system as a system that is created around debt and credit relations, you're also making another move that modern finance prevents us from doing. It's, it, is, it forces us to link finance to the money system. We're looking through the relations of debtors and creditors in the private economy, and we have to think about in times of financial instability, where liquidity comes from. And when you think about liquidity and where it comes from, it can come only from some entities that have bigger asset, um, bigger balance sheets than the, the current uh, people who are trying to source liquidity. And ultimately liquidity can provide, be provided only by the state because only the state or its central bank has the power to issue a currency that will retain its nominal value under all circumstances. It might lose its real value, we know about inflation, but it will retain its nominal value because only the state can make this cre credible commitment to stand behind its currency. It cannot be liquidated and it can unilaterally 
pledge the future economy, not only pledge its own um, uh, survival is what corporations can do and can do only imperfectly because corporations ultimately um, can fail. So I think we have seen in, in finance and um, uh, basically two ship passing in the dark from each other, the development of post Keynesian, post Minskian ideas about how to understand financial systems by looking through flows, mostly flows of interdependent balance sheets and debt relations and how this builds stress in the system regularly leads to breakdowns and financial instability and how in those kind of circumstances, rescue can only come from above. So we always have hierarchy in financial system. Perry Merling himself has said, finance or money, money systems are inherently hierarchical. And in the last instance, we can get um, liquidity only from central banks, from some central banks here. Of course, we also have to qualify because if the central banks or the countries have relinquished their own currency, they can't do it. And if they have incurred too much debt in foreign currency, their hands are bound too. So here again, we have legal structures. What are the monetary regimes and how do they commit even sovereign states to um, fulfill their debt in other currencies and often even under, under, under foreign law is, is again a legal structure. But so we have basically Minsky that sort of sets the ground, I think, for the ideas that we have to think about money and financial systems as institutionally structured and have to look at the flows through these systems. Uh, Perry Mellon calls this the plumbing of the system and, 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 and looks at these structures. And on the other hand, we have modern finance theory that sticks sort of to, um, to relatively abstract notions of finance, uh, where what is being traded is basically being treated as if it was just another market, as if the financial assets that are being traded are widgets that can be um, traded, you know, demand and supply and don't have characteristics of their own, uh, which might have an impact on what will happen in these markets um, in the future. Modern finance theory has found an expression in uh, an interdisciplinary uh, project, uh, the law and finance literature that came uh, about in the late 1990s, spearheaded by Andre Schleifer at Harvard and his colleagues, uh, Rafaela Porta is the lead author of most of the papers that they produced. And they have, and I think telling the, tellingly, the papers also called Law and Finance. I have later written a paper which I call Law in Finance to make the difference, but law and finance is really about fi financial markets as conceived in modern finance theory that nonetheless rely to some extent on certain aspects of the law, but also law understood in a very narrow um, and very instrumentalized fashion. Law being understood as something that um, in ensures that investors are protected, that investors can always enforce their rights. So we look at shareholder rights and we look at how powerful shareholders are in holding management accountable, um, including also taking cases to the court. And so they, the only uh, variables that are coded in the empirical literature that they have built are shareholder empowerments. There's of course no talk about workers to the contrary. Uh, workers are a cost to the firm and, and to, to shareholders um, rather than something that should be enforced in the interest of, of um, investors. Um, so the law and finance theory is basically bringing modern finance and the law together and has had an, an enormous influence on law schools as well. And I think one could even say even on, on legal practice, if you look at the um, development of case law in especially in the United States about corporate law, uh, the shareholder value maximizing model has deeply influenced um, uh, the, the, the case law in the state of Delaware, which really writes the law for corporations in the United States. So very powerful performative uh, functions that narrows the view of the law, which used to be very different. So if you go back to the 1920s, you have Justice Cardozo talking about um, in the duty of loyalty as a punctilio of an honor, um, and that would never be bent. And of course it has been bent in the name of shareholder um, value maximization. Now there has been, and this is um, really what I, what I really want to emphasize today, there has been an alternative strand in the intellectual history of bringing law and finance together. And I think it's the strand that you could associate with Minsky and post Minsky, Minsky um, um, writings and, and analysis. I myself have contributed to this. I wrote a paper in, uh, which was published in 2013, which is called A Legal Theory of Finance, basically making the point that all financial assets are legal commitments. Every IOU 
it's a commitment that is worth anything only if it is enforceable. If it's not enforceable, then you cannot trade it with anonymous parties in large financial markets. Um, you might be able to do this in spot markets. You might be able to do this in small little um, settings where we have much monitoring reputational bonds. But in large anonymous markets, you can sell promises. And ultimately, these are promises only if there's a credible commitment to enforce them. So the law is always in them. And of course, it's it's deeply um, in them, especially in our very complex uh, st structured financial markets today. But rather than basically uh, uh, rehearse again what I wrote in the 2013 paper, I just want to give you a couple of quotes and maybe elaborate on them um, from more recent authors who are arguing in the similar vein, even if they come from slightly different directions. So, so let me just quote from a recent article by Christine Desan, who teaches at Harvard Law School. She has um, worked on the history of money and has called money a constitutional project by basically looking at the evolution of money in England and then and generalizing from that. More recently, she has really made the connection between the constitutional project of money and financial assets. And she basically started or forced herself, who's, you know, she's a constitutional lawyer, more a public lawyer than a private lawyer. She started from the other end and said, in financial markets, um, parties have incentives to create something like near money. Near money is fungible. There's always a lot of demand for near money. So if we look at near money, basically highly liquid financial assets that have debt features, that, well, she basically says near money has three principal design components. They're made of debt. That debt is specifically fashioned to create liquidity and the debt or credit medium that results comes with a pledge of value. And the pledge of value is to convert it into dollar on demand. Of course, when that happens and there's not enough dollar to go around among private parties, you again have to go up in the hierarchy that I mentioned earlier to ensure that liquid liquidity will be provided. So in the last instance, only state made money is really truly liquid. Let me give you another quote um, from Robert Hockett and Sally um, Amarova, two colleagues at Cornell Law Schools, also deeply involved in trying to understand the legal structures of our financial and money systems. Um, they're basically saying, they're, they're calling um, the financial system as a franchise. At its core, they say the modern financial system is effectively a public-private partnership that, that is most accurate, accurately, if unavoidably, metaphorically interpreted as a franchise arrangement where the government franchises its money to the private sector. And they go on to say, when a public instrumentality directly or indirectly accommodates or monetizes a private liability, it effectively extends the full faith and credit of the sovereign, in the case of the dollar of the United States or in the case of other currencies, to that to that private assets. If you think about this in the hierarchy of finance, you're thinking about basically private assets sort of being um, uh, taken on onto the balance sheet of, 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 of banks, the largest dealer banks who have then reserve accounts with, um, with, the, um, um, with the central bank and, from, and that's where the monetization takes place. But in the expectation of that, the shadow of the monetization creates basically the financial system. And then maybe um, uh, last but not least, um, uh, Carolyn Sissoko, who teaches at Bristol, is uh, a, a lawyer and economist who has a PhD in economics, in economics and a JD um, from Stanford. And she has really started to look both historically in the in, at the development of central banking, but also very deeply into our um, uh, financial markets today. She does what I have liked to call in the past an institutional autopsy of our financial systems by looking for example, what the repo market um, has done to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, the, the financial system that we have. And she basically um, says at some point, in an environment where funding on repo, so repo is a legal structure, right? Repo is a contractual agreement by which one party sells an asset, transfers title to somebody else with a commitment to repurchase it after a lapse of time, can just be overnight. Um, and, and then they agree on a certain price is being paid. Um, a repo is old. It has very often been used to circumvent uh, regulations such as usury rules. Um, similar you know, uh, things have been used also to get around um, uh, capital controls. Um, but, but repos are a fundamental fact of, of um, um, financial markets today. And she says, in an environment where funding on repo 
which is creating liquidity in this markets so to bring this back to Christine Dessan, in which um, funding on repo is the norm, fiscal policy cannot be separated from its effect on the money supply. Because the issue of new debt, or in other words, collateral supply has become a money market phenomenon. So public money, sovereign debt money is being used as collateral and in repo markets to generate more liquid liquidity for, for creating private instruments, which ultimately have to land back on the balance sheet of the central bank. So long story short, what I want to suggest that after a long history, decades, where um, a more neoliberal approach or modern financial approach to financial system has dominated, and then through the law and finance literature, actually has deeply also influenced the thinking of lawyers, um, academic lawyers about how financial systems operate over the last 15 years, 20 years almost, um, um, but certainly since the global financial crisis, we have seen an increase in writing by lawyers who take a deep dive into how our financial systems are structured in the law and are generalizing from that about financial systems and money systems. I think there are important um, um, uh, benefits of doing that. One of the most important might be basically to break down the barrier between macro and micro. They're interlinked. That's just absolutely critical. And I think we can show institutionally how they're interlinked and how they involve, as Carolyn Sasako su suggests, not only it's not only the money and debt and credit is linked, that Minsky told us already, but that actually through the practices of financial markets today, we're also linking fiscal policy indirectly or quite directly, if you think about it, to financial markets. Now, the irony here, and that's the last thing I want to say, the irony here is that the agents who have the most direct influence on in how financial markets operate, most central bankers, are still working for the most part within the neoliberal paradigm. In, in his book on the New Lombard uh, Street, uh, Perry Merling basically said is that they were engaged in a chaotic dance by which they were trying to anticipate what these you know, autonomous markets out there would, would do, not realizing how deeply endogenous whatever the central bank would do would be to these markets and how the central bank's activities are part and parcel of these markets. So just let me let me stop here, but make a, a, a big pitch for bringing um, uh, lawyers into the debate. And so I also very much appreciate that I was invited to talk to you today here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Um, now we look forward to hear the comments of, of Bruna Ingrao about this. Uh, this is quite connected with the title of your last book, Bruna. Bruna? Uh, well, um, just a moment. I have... Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much uh, for this presentation. And um, of course, uh, I very much agree with the basic uh, claim by Katarina Pistor about the importance of law and the institutional aspect of financial markets. So I cannot but uh, absolutely in, uh, uh, in agreement with her uh, point of view in this respect. What uh, I miss a little more in her uh, um, presentation is another aspect uh, of finance, uh, which is also a very important part in the history of economics, although it has not been the do dominant uh, uh, part of, in uh, recent uh, uh, mainstream literature. And this is uh, um, the role of finance uh, as uh, the source, uh, the, um, um, in um, the source of um, support to investment and innovative change. This is the long-term perspective that of course everybody knows uh, was uh, introduced by Schumpeter, but not only by Schumpeter, other major authors like uh, Ludwig Sell or Irving Fischer or other uh, looked at finance in this uh, in this uh, perspective. And here I miss something, and here I really miss something because I think that we should uh, balance in a way our view of contemporary finance uh, in between two extremes. One is the extreme of looking at finance uh, 
as uh, the perfect markets, the efficient market. Uh, um, in what, what Katarina so effectively criticized. Uh, so the equilibrium of stocks and everything. I, I'm very in favor of that. But I uh, would be very careful in not uh, um, forgetting the role of finance as an engine for growth, because uh, this is an also uh, in another uh, in another um, in another very important role. So I'll spend uh, just a few minutes on this. First of all, uh, in the historical perspective. Finance has been very important in, uh, as a part of the evolution of the capitalist society, but not just uh, of the capitalist society, but I would say of the process of growth. So we cannot forget about that in historical, in long term historical perspective. But then we have to face today a major challenge, which is the challenge to develop a complex transition towards new technology to avoid global, global warming. That is, the contemporary society has to face this challenge of massive investment and technological change, possibly to go towards a path of sustainable growth. And so away from the uh, actual path, which is so destructive of world uh, resources. Now, what would be the role of finance in this process? We cannot do this change without FISON, without the support of finance, without financial institutions, which are able to support the, 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 you know, the, 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 the complex uh, um, investment uh, activities which are necessary for this change. And the second aspect which I would like to underline is the role of finance uh, in our society also to promote uh, security and welfare. Uh, I don't want to be here, the, 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 you know, just the, the, the one who is uh, saying oh, how, how nice is finance, but just to look at what we do with finance in our contemporary society. And this is, uh, for instance, insurance, this is pension funds, uh, this is uh, health insurance, uh, uh, this is uh, mortgage to buy um, homes, uh, uh, this is credit to finance access to education. And unfortunately, we saw the frailties of finance exactly in some of these big institutions. For instance, the uh, 2007, 2009, crisis was uh, uh, showed the uh, frailty of some of these basic institutions, but these basic institutions are essential for uh, the guarantee of some uh, standard of life to millions uh, of people in the contemporary world. So I would like to, um, to call attention to the necessity to look at this side of finance and also, uh, well, um, we have to find out, so legal answers, institutional answers to reduce the instability of this uh, financial institution or the, fra uh, the fragility of the financial system, but at the same time, uh, we should know that uh, we, we cannot do without. Um, just uh, one la last comment uh, would be on, uh, on the history of economic, um, uh, more specifically on the history of economic. We have a quite long tradition in the history of economic thought uh, of people who have thought about uh, um, uh, financial instability. Uh, this is a very interesting aspect of the history uh, of the evolution of the history of economic thought in the 19th and the 20th century, because it is not that it doesn't exist any literature. It was not just Minsky 
there were a lot of people who, uh, starting from the beginning of the 19th century, uh, you know, Henry Thornton was thinking about the, how to respond to liquidity crisis in uh, Great Britain at the beginning of the 19th century. And I would like to remind uh, the contribution by um, Curzio Giannini of the Italian Central Bank, who wrote a book to explain uh, uh, which are the institutional uh, um, factors which help the development of central banking. Um, so this uh, tradition exists, but there has been a split in macroeconomics uh, so that the uh, thinking about the financial structure was in a way uh, took out from uh, uh, some very important dominant currents of macroeconomic thought. And then this uh, very long tradition in the history of economic thought has been in a way pushed aside, starting from the rational expectation revolution in the, in the 80s, uh, uh, in the 70s, and then uh, the 80s. Uh, well, I think I stop here and thanks so much for your patience and attention. Katarina. Yes, uh, thank you, Bruna. Uh, let me just first say that, of course, there have been um, many other economic voices um, in the past. I don't want to only reduce it to Minsky, but I, since I want to come to the present faster, I didn't, didn't do as much in the past. But the old institutionalists, John Commons, others, and of course, other thinkers before them have um, dealt with these issues. Let me just say a, for, a word about finance. Of course, finance is critical, right? For, I mean, Minsky says capitalism is a financial system. You know, it's, it's basically making bets on an unknown future and creating the instrument to do so and backing it, backing it with um, some kind of you know, guarantee. The question is how we do this, right? So if we think about um, finance as really a franchise between the government and financial institutions, the question is how much of the cream um, can shall the private sector take? Um, and what are the effects of allowing certain types of financial systems to evolve on distributional issues on inequality and on financial instability. So on the issues that you mentioned, pension funds, healthcare, in the United States, a large part of these provisions are actually provided by a particular type of finance. It's securitization um, involving a lot of highly tax subsidized institutions such as REITs, uh, real estate investment trusts that were repurposed for, for these um, uh, purposes that are taking apart hospitals and are trying to make them profit centers for their own investors. So yes, finance is the lubricant for everything. But the question I think that we confront is um, whether we can afford, you know, a financial system that's inherently unstable, needs a lot of backing by the state through the central banks. Whenever there's a hiccup, the central banks have to stand ready and yet delivers not necessarily an outcome, but delivers on financial returns. Um, I think one of the most striking features of sort of the ballooning financial system is that at the same time, we have actually less investment. We have something like stagflation, uh, have had this for quite some time, even as the financial system basically feeds on itself and creates more and more. And I think the mechanisms through which it, 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 it expands, even as it doesn't deliver, are well known now. It's through legal mechanisms that create the illusion of certainty in the future. And given that central banks are ready to stand by and back it, it's no surprise that we have diverted um, you know, a lot of resources, including the intellectual resources of lawyers and financiers to creating new products um, rather than creating um, a real world uh, output. Um, so, so I think we, we just have gone in a, in, a, in a direction that is deeply problematic. But I'm looking at the time, so we better stop here. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. To you. Thank you. Uh, uh, before thanking Katerina and Bruna, Katerina, may I ask you a short question? about a curiosity that I have. What is your opinion on digital money and their legal basis? If you can give, of course, it's more complicated than can, can be uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, but if you can give a short comments about it. Yeah, I, I think that digital money um, gives us an opportunity to cut out the middleman if we really wanted to, at least in payment systems. So central bank digital currency, CBDCs could, it remove a lot of instability in financial systems by assuring that everybody has a wallet with a central bank to make its, their payments. We still have to think about how to plug in a credit system and how to allocate credit. 
but we could basically eliminate the franchise for the payment system. We might want to still have some franchising for credit system, but I think it has a lot of potential. I, though, I fear, however, that the central banks are not going down that road because they're too much influenced by the thinking of the private banks. Thank you, Katerina, really. Thank you, thank you, Katerina. Thank you, Bruna, for this very interesting discussion. And now the third pillar, globalization. Danny Roderick is with us and will uh, give his speech about this issue and then discuss with, with Maurizio Franzini. Danny Roderick. Thank Danny you. Roderick is connected. It's, um, yeah, can you hear me? Ah, yes, yes. Thank you for being um, with us. There. It's very nice uh, to be with you, and it's great to, to follow on um, Sam and, and, and Katerina's uh, presentations and the, um, and the discussion that followed. I think it's been a really very rich uh, uh, discussion. Um, I was going to, to share my screen, or was going to try to share my screen because I have some slides, uh, but I, it, I'm told that that's not going to be possible. Um, so um, I'll have to do this without slides, um, uh, which sort of makes me feel a little bit naked, um, given how I've used to uh, become used to to, um, to to do this with slides. But um, just as we've heard um, in the areas of uh, um, labor markets and employment relationships and, and finance, uh, I think it's fair to say that there is significant changes going on uh, in the world of globalization as well, or how we uh, perceive uh, globalization. Um, I'd like to, to uh, quote to you um, two statements from leading statesmen uh, around 20 years ago, uh, one from Bill Clinton and one from Tony Blair. Um, uh, about um, sort of how the, 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 the narrative around globalization and how globalization used to be discussed uh, around uh, two decades ago. Uh, and, and in 2001, Bill Clinton said, uh, globalization is not something we can hold off or turn off. It is the economic equivalent of a force of nature like wind or water. Um, Tony Blair, just a couple of years later, um, I think this was to a, um, uh, the Labour Party con Congress, he said, I hear people say we have to stop and debate globalization. You might as well debate whether autumn should follow summer. Um, so what's interesting in these quotes is, is, is sort of the physical metaphor being used to describe globalization as a, a completely immutable um, and uh, permanent feature of our, of our um, environment. And it's, it's hard to imagine that anybody, any policymaker, politician, or even economist would talk about globalization in those terms anymore. Um, I think there's a, there's a much greater understanding that uh, globalization can ebb and flow, and, but more importantly, that globalization can take uh, many different forms. And um, uh, while that realization, I think, has become uh, clearer in the um, last couple of decades, I think there's still a lot of um, discussion as to what the future of development is going to look like. And, and in, the, in the limited amount of time, I'm just going to give you my views on that. Um, first, about the, the changes in the nature of uh, globalization. Um, even in the uh, course of the you know, sort of you know, six, um, seven uh, decades after the end of the uh, Second World War, I think it's fair to say we've had you know, two different types of globalization. Um, I think sort of the Bretton Woods model of globalization, which I would say lasted through the 1980s, although the exchange arrangements, of course, collapsed in the second half of the 1970s was very different from what I've called the hyper-globalization model that uh, got settled uh, in the 1990s. Um, I think the, the early post-war model of trade liberalization, which sometimes has been described as a model of embedded liberalism, uh, was one that uh, essentially tackled restrictions, trade restrictions at the border, um, uh, liberalization remained limited in scope. Um, capital account management was the rule rather than the expect, expect, uh, exception. Um, and each country had significant amount of policy space or autonomy uh, to pursue uh, their own social or developmental or growth models. 
Um, after the 1990s, I think in line with the um, sort of um, the, the quotes uh, that I gave you from uh, Bill Clinton and, and Tony Blair, um, I think there was a, a very different um, approach um, and that sort of on the one hand with the onset of financial globalization, on the, one, on the other hand with the uh, movement towards the World Trade Organization, uh, essentially, we move to a world of, of uh, deep uh, economic integration where trade agreements became increasingly uh, um, focused on tackling so-called behind the border restrictions, that is domestic pol policies. Um, capital mobility became the norm. Uh, international firms and banks became the new agenda setters, the rule uh, setters. Um, and the, this approach was essentially predicated on, on sort of a background idea that different economic models would essentially converge to a kind of a similar uh, ideal. And essentially, I think the post sort of the hyper post 1990 hyper globalization model increasingly um, came to view globalization uh, as an end rather than the means. And we can see this uh, transition in how we thought of globalization by, for example, comparing the original uh, preamble to the uh, 1947 GATT versus any number of recent trade agreements. So when we go back to the GATT agreement of 1947, the objectives of this purportedly trade agreement is described as, and I'm quoting here, raising standards of living, ensuring full employment, uh, and a large and steadily growing volume of real income and effective demand, developing the full use of the resource of the world. And then expanding trade as exchange of goods comes you know, almost like a, a, an afterthought. Whereas if we look at most recent trade agreements like you know, the, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the EU-Canada um, uh, Comprehensive um, Economic and Trade Agreement, uh, essentially, the objective becomes uh, promoting economic integration, liberalizing trade and investment, uh, uh, reduction or eliminations of barriers to trade and investment. Uh, so this is very much a kind of a, a perversion or a, a reversal of the prior priorities uh, that accompanied our movement into hyperglobalization uh, as um, the world economy became the end. Um, and domestic economic policies uh, became the means. And that, by the way, was common between the political right and the political left. Uh, some of the policies might have differed, um, uh, but in each case, those policies were sold increasingly as um, the price or the consequence of having to compete in a global economy. So the right would say, we need to cut taxes, we need to um, reduce the regulatory burden, uh, why? So that we can better compete in the world economy. The left would say we need to invest in education, we need to invest in infra infrastructure. Uh, why? So we can be better competitors in the world economy. Um, so I think the first really major um, sort of change that we need to understand is, is the need to change uh, that narrative. Um, that in fact, economic globalization is not just one thing, it can be many different things. Um, and there are many different choices that we make uh, as we design um, a globalization regime. In particular, a key question is um, uh, um, how, how much should uh, rules uh, that any market needs, including global markets, um, how far these rules should reach uh, and constrain domestic economic policies. Um, in fact, our post-1990 uh, movement into hyper-globalization in many ways echoed um, a, a even earlier model of globalization. I talked about the Bretton Woods model, but if you go back to sort of, you know, the late 19th century model of globalization, the gold standard model, um, in many ways, our post-1990 model of hyper-globalization uh, echoed uh, this fundamental feature of the gold standard, uh, which was that the rules of the world economy would impinge upon and constrain uh, what domestic economic policy could do, in particular, the extent to which domestic economic policy could respond to the needs of the local economy. During the 19th century in the gold standard, of course, the issues were largely limited to questions of 
uh, monetary policy. Um, and uh, because under the rules of the gold standard, of course, monetary policy was completely on automatic pilot and um, domestic monetary authorities couldn't respond um, to um, uh, demands for increased liquidity or lowering of interest rates. And of course, interestingly, that was um, the reason why uh, perhaps the earliest uh, populist movement uh, in, in history, that of the sort of the populists of the United States in the late 19th century, grew particularly as a backlash to the globalization of the time. Um, I think many people will remember the famous um, uh, statement by William Jennings Bryan running for um, the presidency of the United States in 1896, uttering the very famous quote, uh, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. In other words, you should not let the, um, the livelihoods of ordinary um, uh, um, working people be determined by the requirements of the global economy. Of course, that was a time when, um, uh, thanks to a combination of declining uh, agricultural prices on world markets and a relative shortage of liquidity, that is gold, uh, sort of nominal interest rates were high, making the real interest rates on the farmers, the, the debt burden on US farmers um, uh, very severe. And of course, that was the economic basis uh, for the rise of the, the populist movement uh, in, in the United States back in the late 19th century. I think that that story is interesting because it's an earlier echo of, I think, sort of the, the, the most recent uh, backlash to globalization, which I think um, also reflects this um, unease uh, that uh, policymakers and politicians have uh, either really been constrained or have acted as if they were constrained by the rule of the global economy uh, in being unable to respond uh, to the uh, needs of, of uh, local labor markets to maintain labor standards, to maintain growing wages and better working conditions for, for significant segments uh, of, the, um, of the labor markets in the advanced countries. I think there are essentially um, three fundamental sources um, of tensions that are exacerbated uh, by the kind of hyper-globalization we had after the 1990s level, at the economic level, there is a tension between um, the gains from specialization that the Smith-Ricardo model gives us versus the gains from productive diversification, which the you know, Alexander Hamilton or the Friedrich List model of development gives us. On the one hand, we have the um, uh, um, uh, story that we benefit, nations benefit by specializing according to comparative advantage. But there's the story, the countervailing story from Alexander Hamilton, Friedrich List, that in fact, countries that are not at the productive frontier uh, should actively defy their uh, um, comparative advantage and try to diversify their economies. So that's sort of one source of tension that's exa exacerbated by hyperglobalization. Um, second attention is um, what we might call it attention um, that has to do with distributive justice or how the pie is distributed. Uh, that is that the redistributive effect of trade liberalization are the flip side of the gains from trade. This is fundamental to the theory of trade the Stolper-Samuelson theorem and a, and a wide variety of extensions suggests that redistribution is a permanent and a significant component of, of, of the gains from trade, that we cannot have the gains from trade without redistribution. Earlier, um, uh, Sam uh, mentioned uh, the work on, on uh, the China trade shock um, or, or NAFTA. Um, and I think those have become sort of much more real that, that we find that um, uh, there's been significant redistributive effects of, um, of, of, of trade agreements that often politicians and economists have poo-pooed over, even though those distributive effects are baked into trade theory. Um, third, there is a, um, a, a tension uh, that um, one might call sort of a, a tension that arises from politics uh, much more broadly, which is the need of domestic politics to be responsive uh, to uh, domestic preferences uh, and, and needs. And here the tension is between 
the gains from trade on the one hand versus the gains from reg regulatory diversity. The gains from trade are reaped and maximized when national differences, national regulatory differences are actually um, uh, are, 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 uh, are reduced uh, because those differences in, in regulations can act as transactions costs. So, um, uh, you know, in, in financial globalization, uh, an important part of um, the push towards financial globalization has been a sort of a convergence um, in uh, in, 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 in banking and financial regulations, and also in sort of downward convergence in corporate tax rates. Um, uh, but uh, if to the extent that different nations have different preferences over financial stability versus financial innovation, for example, different preferences over tax rates, uh, there are also national benefits to being able to be different, that is to have different policies. Um, and uh, in a world in which we simply maximize the gains from trade and, and the arbitrage forces that comes from globalization would be one, in fact, we would be minimizing the gains from regulatory diversity. And that's why, once again, that the world for hyper, of hyper-globalization, I think, creates uh, significant uh, tensions uh, because it, it undermines the benefits from uh, regulatory diversity. Now, I, I think a lot of these tensions uh, can be managed uh, by, um, uh, by thinking more seriously and uh, by taking economics a little bit more seriously, actually, uh, because um, uh, in international economics, um, virtue is generally its own reward. That's what we teach our students. Uh, that is that, you know, generally freer trade expands national welfare, in quotation marks, subject to considerations of market failures and redistribution. So therefore, there should be a strong presumption that actually well-governed countries will choose policies that are generally optimum from a global standpoint as well. That doesn't mean that countries will not mistake that make mistakes and that those mistakes might affect others. But the point is that when they do make such mistakes, for example, by pursuing excessively tr protective trade policies, for example, that they tend to bear the bulk of the costs. Um, now, it is not clear in such circumstances that international rules uh, that constrain what governments can do can reliably prevent such mistakes. Uh, even though international commitments, international trade agreements, international rules can alleviate uh, time inconsistency, they can also empower vested interests, as we've seen in the cases of financial globalization and, and, and trade agreements, which have been largely captured by business and financial interests. Um, where um, international rules, international agreements really have a major role to play in constraining national action is really in the areas of global public goods or global public bads. And most of those actually are not in the economic domain. So we think about climate change, pandemics, public health, um, uh, uh, but the world economy on its own is actually not a global commons and doesn't really have the feature uh, that would call for significant global regulation and standardization. Um, and therefore, I think the kind of globalization we should want uh, would be significantly sort of constrain domestic economic policies in significantly less than what we've had under hyper-globalization. Such a globalization would discipline uh, um, bigger thy neighbor policies explicitly and enforce rules for global public goods, um, but would otherwise leave significant space for pol pol policy autonomy and institutional diversity across nations. So when I, um, to conclude, um, when I turn to the, uh, the future of globalization, um, I see potentially uh, three paths that we could pursue, that we could uh, um, go down. Uh, you know, I might call those the bad, the ugly, and the good. Uh, so the bad is a kind of a 1930s style collapse in global economic cooperation, um, followed perhaps with the rise of hard right or hard left regimes. I don't think that's a very realistic outcome uh, because the underlying uh, political uh, economy of trade policy in countries today is very different than back in the 1930s. Um, the ugly uh, scenario, which is perhaps a little bit more likely, is that we continue in a world with creeping populism and protectionism that would gradually erode both liberal democracy and, an open, and a moderately open world economy. I think that's probably where we might be headed. 
what I would call the, the good scenario uh, as essentially one that would actively uh, involve a rebalancing that steps back from hyperglobalization and I think see seeks a thinner globalization uh, with a greater space uh, for reconstruction of national social contracts and what those what that reconstruction of national social contracts is would be, of course, in a whole different uh, subject, um, which I don't have time to talk to, but um, Sam, Sam and, 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 and uh, Katerina already gave us um, a good sense of what some of the elements of that might be. So let me just stop here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Uh, really interesting what you have said. Now, uh, we'd like to hear the comments of Maurizio Franzini about your speech. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny, for your presentation. Um, well, I can start from Marcello De Cicco. Well, because having, uh, uh, I've read recently an old paper by Marcello, not so old, it was about 10 years ago, when he was very worried about the destiny of the middle class. Because he, he wrote that the middle class to be considered the great loser of those times. And the middle class is the champion of the so-called capitalism with a human face. That's what he said. And he feared that this weakness would lead to a serious deterioration of social relation, which are at the heart of the uh, economic system. Now, what, why I'm starting from this? Because it seems that any two is very worried about the middle class. And uh, one of the consequences uh, is, is from the uh, hyperglobalization is the shrinking of the, of the middle class, especially in developed countries. Now, I'm not completely sure that we can talk about the sh shrinking of the middle class. It's a difficult concept, but for sure we have a problem with people that one sometimes ago was called middle class. They are suffering and they are the loser in some sense. Most of them are the loser. Now, I would like to know more about this uh, from Danny, if uh, he could add something about the relationship this is between hyperglobalization and what happens to the middle class, also through the effects upon domestic policies, he was mentioning uh, in this respect. One thing which really, I was really surprised to learn is that multinationals sometimes can sue national government <clears throat> if they change policy and this is against their own interests. Maybe this has happened not many times, but at least a couple of times has happened. And I find it incredibly, uh, I mean, that's incredible to me that something like this can happen. But going back to the middle class, um, uh, which are the aspects of globalization? Is that a matter of globalization itself or is it also a matter of the joint effect of globalization and technological change, uh, which has produced what many people say is a kind of hollowing out in the middle of the ranking of the jobs and of the tasks, which has, uh, in some sense, uh, disadvantaging the middle class. And if we remember what has been said by Aristotle and others about the importance of having a strong middle class, we should be worried a lot. But the question I want to ask you, um, the second question I want to ask you then is the following one. You have written, you, re, you, you read so many things, all, all of, almost all of them are challenging <laughs> ideas. And you have written about the relationship between ideas and interests, uh, which is something uh, I consider very, very, very important in order to understand what's going on. So the question I want to ask is, first, how you see the relationship between ideas and interests? We have a complex idea, not a simple one, I must say. And, uh, but if we should uh, tackle the problem of changing policies, both at national and supranational level, do you think it is a matter mainly of producing new ideas or contrasting uh, strong interests uh, given also the cost in terms of, let's see what's happening, what, 
we are saying today about the problem of climate change, the cost of climate change was going to be there. We have been in some sense too far uh, uh, in a direction which to reverse would impose a lot of costs. So can we have interest, ideas, and the cost of changing as three elements, which should not make us too much optimistic about the future. Thank you, Maurizio. Denny. Well, thank you, uh, Maurizio. Those are um, difficult questions. As, let me try to tick off just a few things uh, without doing them full justice. Um, on the relationship between hyperglobalization and um, the middle class, um, I would just say you know two things. One is that it is true that um, technological change um, has been uh, a significant, probably much more significant driver than trade per se um, on a sort of what's called labor market polarization and the decline of earnings and the disappearing of jobs in the middle of the skill distribution. But, um, but technological change itself has been part of a response to this globalization, because I think the reason that technological change has been so skill biased in the last few decades is precisely an attempt to compete better with the labor uh, compared labor based comparative advantage of low cost exporters in the developing world. So I think the technological, the bias in the, in the direction of technological change uh, um, has been partly a response to globalization. So I don't think uh, we can think of technological change as being independent from hyperglobalization. The second thing, just to give a very concrete example of how hyperglobalization mattered. Let's compare how um, the US um, responded to the Chinese competitive threat to how it responded um, in, uh, to the Japanese competitive threat in the, in the 1980s. Um, and in the 1980s, it was actually Reagan, so a Republican president who basically responds to Japan by instituting voluntary export restraints, restraints on steel, on cars and motorcycles, essentially, you know, this was still the tail end of the Bretton Woods era, but the idea was that, you know, it was okay to engage in trade policies that would carve out, essentially uh, employ safeguards to prevent uh, the reduction of employment in so-called sensitive sectors. And of course, in the 1970s, it was textiles through the multi-fiber arrangements. In other words, whenever the domestic social contract came under threat through trade, uh, it wasn't the domestic social contract that would lose out, that would actually put some restrictions on trade. And even under Reagan, that wasn't what's pursued. Whereas under Clinton, under the, you know, after the 2000s and 1990s, and essentially it was like the China trade shock, you know, it was tough, you know, these people have to grin and bear it. You know, this is globalization. There's nothing it's like that, that metaphor about the physical metaphor that, you know, it's like, you know, if you're disagreeing about globalization, it's like you don't think uh, autumn follows the summer. Go back to that Tony Blair quote. So this, this very different attitude about uh, sort of how you deal with globalization and what comes first. I think, you know, uh, I don't think it's the only thing about in terms of its impact on uh, the middle class and, and the labor market polarization, but I think um, had something to do with it. First, deindustrialization was also a very big force here. And that was also aggravated clearly by the forces of globalization. Um, now, on ideas and interests, and I think I would just, you know, say that basically vested interests are particularly very important, but vested interests define where their interests are based on the narratives. And I think both in, you know, Sam's presentation and Katerina's presentation, we've seen how sort of economic ideas, the narratives about how the world works and our objectives really have shaped, uh, you know, key actors' um, decisions on, on, on what to do. So, if, you know, I think banks and firms and even large firms, even multinational firms, think of themselves very differently when they think of themselves as essentially rooted in local societies, being responsive to stakeholders. And you know, when they're not told that their, their sole you know, objective is to maximize shareholder value, uh, where are those ideas coming from that we're living in a global market where you're not rooted and that the sole objective is share, maximizing shareholder value? It's really coming for ideas. And I think that's sort of, you know, if we're able to change those narratives and, and replace them, I think we might find that sort of, you know, that, you know, that powerful vested interest 
you know, they might define their interests in ways that are much more conducive uh, to stability and coherence and, and, and social objectives. Uh, so that's really where, as economists, I think that's where we can make a contribution without, you know, necessarily uh, uh, dismissing the very significant importance of power. But I think the purpose to which power is deployed also has to be part of this, 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 this um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, what a great, great pleasure it has been to hear, to listen to all of you. Uh, it was a great discussion, really, so depth and interesting. So we were certain that uh, having such a, a, a scholars with us at the, the level would have been so high. So thank you very much to all of you, to Caterina Pistor and Brulein Grau, Samuel Bolz and Hugo Pagano, Danny Rodrik and Maurizio Francini. The hope is to have them with us again in Italy, we hope when we, we can be many and safely in the same place, listening to them again. So thank you very much from the Marcello De Circo Association, from our listeners and from me personally. Have a good day. Uh, you in the, on the other side of, of the ocean. Uh, good evening for our friends here in Italy. Bye. Thank you.